Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the first uh, colloquium of the School of Astrophysics of this semester. Uh, so, uh, today's speaker uh, is uh, Professor Shubhadeep Dev from Indian University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. Uh, Shubhadeep actually arrived at noon and we were uh, having such good time talking about various things that I didn't really prepare for this introduction, but let me see if I can say a few things from memory. So, uh, Shubhadeep uh, did his undergrads from Bordhavan University, uh, same as our uh, Dr. Ravna Kule, uh, and then uh, went to IIT Kharagpur uh, for the masters, and then University of Groningen for his PhD, and then he was a uh, postdoc at University of Maryland at College Park, and then he came back to India as a uh, scientist at the National Physical Laboratory in Delhi, and then after staying there for almost a decade, less than a decade, uh, he uh, joined Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, in 2019. Um, so it's customary to say a few interesting things. So uh, <laughs> I'll say two of those things. One is, uh, it's, a, it's a curious coincidence that uh, uh, between 2001 and 2003, uh, many people were doing uh, <laughs> MSc in uh, physics in IITs uh, who are present here. <laughs> so it is SSR and SCMAM and me uh, were do, uh, doing it at IIT Kanpur and uh, Professor Shubhadeep Dey was doing that same thing at the exactly same time. So we are the same batch. That's what I mean to say all by, by all these things at IIT Kharagpur. And uh, Dr. Ratna Kode was doing her PhD in, <laughs> in IIT Kharagpur at the same time. So it's indeed a really small world. Um, the other thing that I'd like to mention, which is more serious than this, is uh, Professor Shubhadeep Dey, his, his expertise is in experimental atomic and molecular physics. Uh, but now he is a faculty at Indian University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. So I guess you can ask him about his, you know, this path. But this is, uh, I think, impressive and interesting to me that, you know, we talk about various branches of physics and we always say that, you know, all these branches are actually really, they are not very different, they are connected. But you can see one example here where uh, this connection is very apparent, very conspicuous. And that's not always the case. So I think that's, that's one thing that I really like to mention. The reason Professor Shubhadeep Dey is at Ayuka is, I mean, I guess he will elaborate, but one of the reasons is Ayuka is part of the LIGO India project. And LIGO India, whereas LIGO is measuring, uh, you know, mergers of black holes and you know, detecting the uh, gravitational waves. But for that detection, you need quantum measurement. Because you are measuring things, you know, uh, of the order of 10 to the power minus 21 meter. So, um, so that's how this, this kind of uh, you know overlap between various branches of physics show up, and uh, and that's that's something that you should all keep in mind. Okay, with all that, um, I, I welcome Professor Shubhadeep Dev for this. Uh. Okay, so uh, okay, so thanks Ritubhan and Sanjana for inviting me uh, to give this colloquium here, and about the second question that you brought up that what's the connection between astronomy and atomic physics, I would actually cover some part of it that why I am at Ayuka and how these two things are connected. Basically, we are doing science and the science questions can be answered from different uh, perspectives. Like uh, we are all, I think, probably majority from Bengal, I think, so you know, Dottom of Dr. Bot. And it's practically the same if you take the branch from atomic physics side or from astronomy side, we are finally looking into the fundamental questions to answer these fundamental questions and I will I'll actually cover that part. So that's part of the talk. So let's just wait for it. So let me begin with, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, I'm actually skipping most of the technical part that I am doing in the regular basis in the lab, even though at the last few slides I will cover just to give you a sense, but I thought that's too much technical for MSc students and particularly the PhD students who are majorly from the astronomy, astrophysics, theoretical side, it might not be that much um, uh, like, uh, let's say, attractive to them. So I would rather cover that why do we make an atomic bomb? 
So whenever we talk, uh, when we, when we, whenever we call this thing, this instrument is called clock. So basically it comes in our mind, okay, clock is just to measure time very precisely and accurately. And how accurately is that? It's like uh, picosecond, sub, or maybe femtosecond, who cares about that, that kind of precision of time? Yeah, that's the final thing, when the first thing comes in our mind, even actually when I started this kind of experiment, that also came in my mind that why do I care about a clock which is accurate to 10 to the power minus 16 level or 18 level of accuracy, who cares? I mean, in the daily life we don't care about that. Anyhow, I, uh, but believe me that this kind of clock which has very, very, uh, very, very accurate clocks, they actually have a lot of importance in our daily life also. And I would won't cover that example in today's talk because I'm going to cover mostly about the fundamental science thing. But just think about your uh, mobile phone where you just start a Google map to find out your location. And you know that what sort of accuracy of time is required just this to uh, work this Google map uh, to work out or like you are calling a polar and something like that. Just give a number. So a three nanosecond accuracy gives you 10 meter accuracy of spatial position. And you know like by using Google map, you can find the location within 100 meter accuracy. So it's something like just a ballpark number. It requires sort of 30, 20 to 30 nanosecond accuracy to work just in your mobile phone, which is available all of our, in, a, in all of our pockets. Yeah, now think about sending a, uh, like our Chandrayaan mission. You have to really pinpoint the location uh, on moon. So what sort of accuracy of time would be required for that kind of thing. And today we are going to, I am mostly going to cover about fundamental science. Oh, okay. So, uh, so, uh, so, that's how I actually thought of, can I just go up? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Maybe I can just put this one in this side, so it would be a little better. Okay. So, uh, I have uh, like organized my talk in this way, that is, and the bottom one is the pointer. Okay. Uh, like I will first give you uh, some introduction about the general things. Then I would talk about what is the science motive to build this atomic clock. So by the way, the atomic clock, as I was starting, like the word clock is there, so it comes into our mind that this is like just to measure accurate time or frequency other way around. But that's actually not. Atomic clock is the name of the instrument. It somehow the name is, uh, the clock comes in the name of the instrument. But atomic clock is actually a very good sensor. If you take away the LIGO gravitational wave detector, then other than LIGO, the most accurate instrument in the world is the atomic clock. LIGO just came last few years back in one decade. It's not even one decade. It can really, really measure frequency extremely accurately, and that can be used to sense various things. Like whatever the cause of perturbations of any atomic energy levels, that would reflect into the transition frequency. So you can think in the other way around, you can practically measure any things in the nature which is resulting to an uh, perturbation into the atomic energy levels. You can actually measure that thing just to measure accurately uh, that transition frequency which is the principle of the atomic clock. So atomic clock is a sensor and accurate measurement of time. For example, maintaining a national time scale like Indian standard time is just one application. And for that particular application, you don't need an atomic clock which is accurate to 10 to the power minus 18 seconds. Yeah, so why people then want to build a clock which is accurate to 10 to the power minus 18 fractional accuracy or even better than that, that I will cover uh, in, in my today's lecture. So that is the major, oh sorry, that is the major part I am going to uh, talk about today. And at the end, as I said, I will show you some things that exactly how we are going to build atomic clock in my lab, which is precision quantum measurement lab, or rather PQM lab. Okay, so let me begin. As I, I mean, you can see the picture of a human being, and we have an intuitive mind to explore everything unnecessarily, actually, most of the cases. <laughs> but okay, uh, in a, other than that, and we want to know everything about the universe, right? 
most of the people you are from astronomy background, you want to detect everything in the universe and you want to know everything about the universe. And what are those everything? It's starting from Big Bang, when it started, and then everything, how everything evolved, how the uh, fundamental particles were form, formed, and then from the fundamental particle, how atoms were formed, from the atoms, how molecules were formed, and uh, thereafter, like uh, how the, uh, all the stars were formed, how the planetary systems were formed, and finally, how these things are held together in the universe, in the planetary system. So, uh, why I'm telling you all these things? Because for all these things, what I told him last uh, one minute, <coughs> there has to be some force, some interaction. Either it's formation of the atom, or it's formation of the nucleus, or formation, or keeping these things in the, uh, in the cosmos, like uh, our universe, our planetary systems, and these forces are divided into, sorry, I forgot to click few things, uh, divided into four fundamental forces. This is our BSC or MSC level thing. And these fundamental forces are strong forces, which are responsible to keep the quarks together and form, it, form the uh, neutrons, protons, electrons, right? And then there are weak forces which are responsible for uh, nuclear decay. Neutron converts into the proton or vice versa and cause a daughter nuclei and uh, uh, it's just nuclear decay. Then most commonly known thing is electromagnetic force, that is like two charged particles, they are either repelling each other or attracting each other depending on the sign of the charge and that's most commonly no known thing, right? It's a Coulomb force. And the fourth one is gravitational force, that's why Apple falls towards the earth, right? Or entire planetary, planetary systems are held together. That's why the universe is formed and uh, it stays together, right? Now the problem is, and I'm not going into detail whatever is written there, I think all of you probably know all these things, like uh, they work in different range, they have different strength of the interaction, these are some numbers given there. So for all these forces, there are some mediators, which are mediating these forces, and these are practically bosons. Mm -hmm. Like for example, <coughs> like for example, let's say, for weak forces, these are W or Z bosons and etc. etc. But graviton is yet to be detected. And for that reason, actually, so far, these three forces, strong force, electromagnetic force, and weak force, these three forces can be uh, explained through quantum mechanics. Like quantum electrodynamics, quantum flavor dynamics, quantum chromodynamics, etc. And all together, these three uh, forces which can be explained through quantum mechanics, that is known as standard model of the particle physics. Okay, but the flaw is the gravity cannot be explained through quantum mechanics yet because <coughs> gravity is not detected. And there are many other things which, I mean, people are trying for several, several years. I mean, Ayuka Paddy is one of the pioneering person to work on that thing, but yet uh, uh, that something is not, has not happened yet. But maybe it will happen. So, so standard model of the particle physics is a very well established model which explains the any particles that we see around us, starting from fundamental particles to molecules or anything, from the nucleus to everything. And uh, it's not a complete model. It explains many of the things, but there are many things which have not been explained so far using the standard model. Any examples? Can anybody say anything? For example, yeah, like one of these things. Second thing is like we know there are six fundamental, six quarks. Yes. Yeah, U, C, T, S, uh, what did I forget anyhow? E, B, right. Yeah. Yeah, why there is not a left, right one? <laughs> why there are four fundamental forces? What is the problem if there is a fifth one? Or maybe there is a fifth one, we don't know about it. Okay, so this, there are many, 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 many open questions which we do not have an answer through the standard model picture that we know so far. Even there are many postulates which have not been experimentally verified yet. For example, we consider several symmetries in the standard model. Yeah, Lorentz symmetry and those things, etc. These are fundamental symmetries, but we don't have any direct measurement about those symmetries. We don't have, we, we consider many fundamental constants in our, funda uh, in our uh, standard model, like let's say fine structure constant, electron charge, electron to proton mass ratio, anything. There are many fundamental constants which are dimensionless quantities, but how this constant comes? We use them 
frequently from our standard physics book starting from schools etc but they basically comes through mathematical modeling nature have not decided about this fundamental constant this comes only through the mathematical modeling but who says god never says that you have a fundamental constant in your uh, in your nature so they are really constants or these are just some artifact of our mathematical models etc so you can ask several questions which are which we don't have any answer yet and to explore those things it's called extension of the standard model or beyond standard model even uh, including the gravitational force into it that is also part of the possible extension of the standard model and to do this kind of things on the, there are many mathematical things of course theorists are doing several things they are saying okay standard model is not good uh, theory so let's start supersymmetry model or string theory where you can practically include everything but we need experimental verifications to understand whether these are actually the correct models or not maybe they are correct but we need experimental verifications and to do that uh, to for these experimental verifications people are doing several experiments and some of them i am just pointing out just to motivate you nothing else like first thing is look at the sky you look through the x rays to the ultraviolet to the uh, whatever other you know, gravitational waves etc look at the look at your uh, like uh, uh, cosmos and try to find out answers of some of these questions uh, then it could be like high energy physics experiment and these are two famous ones like fermi lab in us and cern uh, facility and they are doing several experiments to look for uh, new particles um, like you know god particle is one of that etc like why uh, the anomaly between uh, g minus 2 in muon things why the landage factor in muon is not exactly 2 which it should be 2 according to the mathematical modeling but it's actually 2.0000 some 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 numbers why this anomaly comes etc etc uh, what uh, suchetana said like neutrino mass etc so this is super kamya panda and neutrino detectors and so on so you see these are the examples where thousands of people involved in each of this experiment like think about uh, ligo yeah there are thousands of people involved to build the ligo to do the data analysis to a heroic effort in these instrumentations and etc so these are mega science project you have to include several countries you have to generate a huge money you have to take manpower from all the different countries and do this kind of experiments but you are looking for fundamental questions and answer for the fundamental questions there are another category of experiments that is a table top experiment and these are atomic physics experiments mostly uh, some example is like let's say looking into parity violation in a nuclear beta decay so this is a sodium 21 trapped magneto optically trapped sodium actually this is from of where i work even though this is not part of my phd thesis but this is sodium 23 atoms 1 billion atoms magnet optically trapped here and then they do experiment with this little ball so they radioactively decay uh, through a beta decay channel and then look into parity violations into this nuclear beta decay uh, looking into the permanent electric dipole moment of an atom or an electron the atom or electrons or neutrons these are supposed to be spherically symmetric charge distribution right so that is spherically symmetric means they should not have any dipole moment but uh, they may have actually dipole moment it's not exactly spherically symmetric but this dipole moment is extremely small so to look for sorry to look for whether atoms or electron have any permanent dipole moment or not people are again uh, doing atomic physics experiment trap magnet optically trap some of the atoms for example this is uh, sorry this is radium uh, 225 atoms magnet optically trap and this is radium ion and both of them i am looking either into um, searching for permanent electric dipole moment or parity violation experiments permanent electric dipole moment if the atom or fundamental particles has any permanent electric dipole moment then it violates time reversal symmetry parity symmetry and therefore cp symmetry as well considering cpt is a good symmetry but who says cpt has to be a good symmetry this is only prediction from the standard model because we consider cpt is a good symmetry that is sort of a postulate and then derive many other things 
but is it, a, is it really a good symmetry or not? Because parity violation has already been observed. Okay, so that's why CP violation also has already been observed. That means time reversal symmetry also has to violate to make CPT as a good conservation, conserved quantity. And T violation can be, can be experimentally verified if there is a permanent electric dipole moment in atoms or electrons. So that's a very important thing to measure. T violation has to happen if CPT has to conserve. Otherwise, if CPT <coughs> is not conserved, then entire uh, standard model physics has to change. And that is going beyond the standard model. And the, my fourth example is, is what I'm going to talk about, that is clock, which is sense many things, including dark matter, dark energy. It can sense, provided it has enough sensitivity. Okay, and this enough sensitivity has not yet been reached even though the clock accuracy has reached to 10 to the power minus 18 level of fractional accuracy. That's why over the world, there is an heroic effort going on to even enhance the clock accuracy or making a clock network and these clocks are very accurate clocks. I will come to those things. Okay, so what is clock? I think all of you know, you practically need a oscillating thing which oscillates uh, with uh, very good repeatability and etc. Then you can, con from this oscillation you can practically convert it into time and how do you do that? Time, well this is not absolute time but this is time difference. So time is nothing but number of oscillations you count multiplied by period of each oscillation. So let's say the oscillation period is six, uh, one second if you count 60 oscillations, so 60 times 1 second is you want your 1 minute, so that's a clock basically. Okay, so now what do you need to make a very accurate, stable and, oh sorry, accurate, stable and precise clock. How many of you know the difference between accuracy, stability and precise? These are very important thing when you want to do metrology or precision measurement. Anybody wants to say something? Okay, I'm not taking a class, but just to say, like, people generally misunderstand between accuracy and precision. precision. But these are actually very two different things. One measurement, measured quantity can be very precise, but not necessarily uh, has to be very accurate, right? Okay, and if you want to make a very good clock, then the, these are the three things which one has to satisfy one have to measure the oscillation periods and number of oscillations counts very accurately. One have to measure it very precisely and this oscillator also have to be very stable. Like you are measuring a time period which you are calling the time period of a pendulum is one second but this one second has to be one second after 100 years again. Like then only you can make a very good clock. If this one second is changing then you cannot make a very good clock, right? Okay. In few words I think I explained you. So without going into detail, these are the three important things one has to satisfy to make a very accurate clock or rather to make a clock accuracy which is 10 to the power minus 18 or whatever uh, accuracy we are time, we, we are saying. Okay, and then here we are practically showing this thing. So. Sorry, I am actually a little bit confused with this uh, pointer thing. <laughs> so this is a scale of 120 years and why 120 years? This is practically the scale when uh, quantum mechanics was first postulated about 120 years back. Right, that's why I choose 120 years. And during this 120 years, the top layer is showing how the quantum mechanics evolved. Like we started from conceptualization of the quantum mechanics, then many formulas, in, uh, many things were derived, many things were explained through quantum mechanics as I s told you about the standard model particle physics, quantum chromodynamics, quantum chromodynamics, quantum uh, chromodynamics and so on, so on. Then these quantum effects were discovered or uh, was measured in experiment and today we call it an era of quantum 2.0 when we are actually using this quantum mechanical uh, 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 these effects to develop devices. Which are these devices? Like quantum computer, quantum communication, these are the two common examples you probably already heard of. 
And during this 120 years, see how the clock has evolved. So practically you can just look into this plot where the y-axis is showing the duration of a clock over which it shows one second inaccuracy. So let's say a clock is uh, working for t seconds, t hours or t years, then over that t duration, this clock will finally have one second inaccuracy. And this axis, x axis is years. So this is you see like 700, 800 years, but this red portion is 120 years. And you see within this 120 years, like if we go back 120 years, then the clock accuracy was one second inaccurate over one year time scale, sort of, or few years, let's say. So the clocks 120 years back, they were accurate to one second only over one year time scale, or few year time scale, the Harrison's clock. And today, in, after 120 years, we have a clock which is accurate over 300 billion years. So with the inaccuracy of the age of universe, whether it is 13.8 billion years or 26 billion years, it's 20 to 10 times uh, larger than that. Okay, so we, we have an atomic clock today working, not in India, but in elsewhere in the world, which is accurate to one second over 300 billion years. And that kind of sensitivity, we don't need to start this meeting. We don't need it probably for the Google map also, but we need it to sense some fundamental perturbations which is perturbing the energy level of the atoms. And one common example is dark matter, which is going to be the next big discovery expected, right? Maybe in this century, the next expected big discovery will be uh, detecting the dark matter. An atomic clock can do that, or probably will do that. Okay, so having said that, if we, uh, so I, I told you about the stability. I already made half an hour almost, and I am not even 10% of my slides. Okay, anyhow. So uh, the, 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 the thing is like first, this, this is this quantity says the stability of the clock and the first part delta nu by nu zero, nu zero is the clock frequency and delta nu is the line width. That says theoretical quality factor of the clock and you see that if you go to higher frequency, if you have a pendulum which is oscillating at a higher frequency, you have a chance to make better clocks. Why that is the case? You can understand it in this way. Let's say you have a pendulum which is oscillating once per second. And if your counter just misses one count, that means you are inaccurate by one second. Mm. If your oscillator is oscillating zillions per second, and there if you miss just one count, you are actually missing a very small fraction of the second. That's exactly the reason why an accurate clock can be, uh, uh, can be produced by using an oscillator which has very large frequency. You know that present definition of SI second is based on cesium clock, yes, right. which works at 10 to 10 gigahertz frequency, 9.2 gigahertz frequency. Whereas if you can make a clock in the optical frequency domain, which is 10 to the power 15 hertz. So instead of 10 to the power 10 hertz, if you go to 10 to the power 15 hertz, you are enhancing the sensitivity by five orders of magnitude because your new zero is five orders of magnitude higher. So that's why uh, instead of microwave clocks, going to optical clock, you eventually can make a much better clock. Okay, if you go to X-ray or UV, you can even make better clock, but their detection and all these technologies are also uh, not, not mature enough. And why atoms? Because in the atomic system, you can find the transition frequencies which are either in microwave domain or in the optical domain. So you have the transitions which satisfies this very high frequency. These are the most stable oscillator because an atom is an atom. It's same here or in the moon. Uh, it's a most unperturbed system. That's what it means also. You can laser pool trap them. Atom means atoms and, and also ions. You can laser pool and trap them and you can confine them in a very small, like in micron size things where you can practically uh, nurture them as you want. You can control all the environmental parameters, electric fields, magnetic fields, everything very, very accurately over a micron size volume compared to if you have to make a homogeneous electric field and magnetic field, let's say, over these big rooms. You cannot do that, but you can do it in a very small volume. 
So these are the reasons why, I mean, the technology has evolved quite a bit, particularly after laser cooling and trapping. After, uh, like, invention of the lasers and laser cooling and trapping. And that helped us to build this atomic clock much better and better. Okay. So the principle is basically very simple. You have an atom, let's say two-level system. You excite the atom from ground state to excited state. It will go to the excited state due to lifetime of the excited state. It will come back to the ground state. It will produce fluorescence. You measure this fluorescence with respect to the uh, frequency of this exciting exciter. And you sort of get a Lorentzian line set because I think you are from astronomy mm -hmm. thing, so you know that the line uh, uh, unperturbed transition line sets are the Lorentzian set. You measure it, then the central frequency is the nu zero and the line width is delta nu. Okay, so your delta nu by nu zero depends on the line set of your transition that you choose. Now, from there, what we under what we learn, you have to choose a transition. You cannot take any atomic transition to build a clock. But you have to choose a transition where delta nu is very small, right? For an electric dipole transitions, the delta nu's are very large. It's like few tens of megahertz, right? Whereas, you can take other forbidden transitions, which are not electric dipole transitions. Their delta nu can be very, very narrow. Even it could be one nanohertz. So to build a better clock, not only going to high frequency will help you, but you also have to choose a transition where delta nu is very narrow. And that is as narrow as few nanohertz. And these are called, so that's what is practically shown here. That let's say nu zero is 10 to the power 15 hertz, which is optical. If you take delta nu 10 to the power minus, if you take delta nu 10 megahertz, then your accuracy is fraction. This is this quantity is called fractional accuracy or theoretical quality factor which becomes 10 to the power minus 9. Whereas if you take 1 millihertz, then it becomes 10 to the power minus 18. So you have to choose a transition where delta nu is millihertz or less than millihertz, something like that. <coughs> okay, and what are these transitions? If you, I mean, I think in the textbook, we only read about the electric dipole transitions and all the selection rules. And whenever we ask this question in the in any interview, everyone fails because they only hard coded learned in their mind that there is only one type of transition uh, that is electric dipole transition. But that's not true. Quantum mechanics says the, all the higher order transitions are also possible. These are forbidden because they are very hard to try. The probabilities are very small. Probabilities are extremely small. That means extremely hard to drive those transitions. As, so, as, as soon as you go from particle picture to the wave function picture, they are distributed minus infinity to plus infinity. That means all the things are the higher order transitions. If you go to higher and higher order, it's hard to drive, but these are possible. And we have to use one of these transitions to make the clock. And some examples are quad electric quadrupole transitions or octopole transitions instead of dipole ones. Uh, and or hyperfine induced transitions. I'm not going into detail considering the time I have already consumed, but you can look it up uh, somewhere. Okay, now given all these things, this is sort of a history that how atomic clock has evolved. So the first, the idea of using atoms for clock was given by Rabi. That was just after Second World War. Because it was understood that for anything and everything in the war related things to war related weapons, one can make very good uh, weapons like let's say, uh, 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 Atom bomb. Yeah, like not only atom bomb, but let's say missile and everything. You first need to have a very good atomic clock. Otherwise, you cannot send it into the right point. So <laughs> that's why the task was given to Rabi because in 1944, he was getting Nobel Prize. And then, of course, the task was given to Rabi that, okay, tell us what would be the better clock. And he says, okay, let's use atom uh, as, the, as the clock. And then uh, uh, he actually also developed the technique called Rabi, uh, Rabi spectroscopy technique. He developed many things. He's like godfather of the modern atomic physics, let's say. And then uh, after him, his PhD student, Ramze, developed the Ramze spectroscopic technique, which is widely used in building the clock. I'm not again going into those uh, technical details, but if you have questions, we can discuss. 
Then soon after that, in 1955, first cesium clocks was produced by NPL UK. And within three years, it was commercialized. It was that important. There was so much effort going at that time. Okay, we have to make an atomic clock very accurately, and it has to be commercially available. So you see, like 1955, it was lab demonstrated. In 1958, commercially, this thing was available. And until today, the same commercial cesium clock is available. More or less, there is a little bit improvement in the electronics, but it's exactly the same principle. And then many things has happened. In 2014 and 18, the optical clocks were first demonstrated with an accuracy of 10 to the power minus 17, 18, so on. And it's expected within a couple of years from now, the present SI definition of second will be redefined with respect to optical clock, which at present is based on the cesium microwave clock. Because, but, but there are some certain criteria has to be fulfilled, and we hope that it will be fulfilled in the next couple of years. And then SI second will again be redefined. Other than this is the other side, which is the time and frequency metrology and kind of thing. Other than the interest of building better and better clocks for exploring fundamental time. Okay, so just quickly. So the present microwave clock, which are cesium clocks, but in this case, these green lines are cesium fountain clocks, which are which uses cesium magneto-optically trapped cold sample of cesium atoms, which are cooled to nearly zero degree Kelvin, like two tenths of micro degree micro Kelvin temperature. They have reached sort of acu fractional accuracy ten to the power minus sixteen level, and whereas the optical clock, they have reached a fractional accuracy of ten to the power minus 18 10 to the power minus 19 levels. That's what practically I just told you. And even now there are efforts going on to make nuclear clocks, which are expected to enhance the accuracy by another two orders of magnitude, but it's not yet uh, uh, demonstrated. Okay. So now coming to the fundamental science. Why do we want to build the optical clock? And one is obviously better time and frequency standard. Uh, the other thing is, in day by day, in any daily technologies are also going to be is emerging, like like let's say navigation systems. Uh, I I remember like uh, when first we were using the Google Maps, etc. It was quite a bit inaccurate, but now it's mostly accurate within 50 to 100 meters. And that's possible not only because of some coding and etc., but also in enhancement in the time and frequency synchronization. That's one of the things. Well, maybe one thing you can remember, like uh, uh, this, uh, our metrology department, I forgot the name of the guy during our time. He was always predicting things wrong. Oh, Goldar. Uh, Goldar, right. Rajendra Prasad Goldar. Whenever he said that there will be a uh, rain today, there will, you can 100% you can be assured there will be no rain today. Okay, but you think, you, you see nowadays. So he used to say that he is always missing yeah, yeah, the exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. But you see today's date, it's majorly correct. I mean, you can just start your mobile phones. You can see whether there will be rain. And exact time is also yeah. very much predicted. If you ask to the people why that is the case, the general answer will be because there are more satellites that are taking pictures and etc. That's of course true. But only taking satellite is not the and not solving the problem. The thing is one has to take pictures and have to give a time stamping. And then you have to see how this thing is evolving, how this uh, cloud is moving. Then only you can say, okay, when this cloud will come on top of Kolkata or when it will be hit on some particular portion of the coastal line. So time synchronization is very important for today's very accurate predictions of the weather. And there are many examples. Transportation, all the signaling systems are now automatized. That's because of the good uh, accurate time synchronization. OK. And the other thing is what I was trying to basically say, say like uh, clocks are extremely good sensors. It can sense any small change in the geode. Do you know what is geode? Okay, maybe I can just say geode is basically an equipotential surface on top of our earth. Our surface, our geode is not really spherical. Even if you consider earth is spherical, geode is not spherical because there is somewhere mountain, there is somewhere uh, deep ocean. So depending on hydrocarbons, everything is available. Geode is a very weird structure. And it's very important to know how the geode level is changing in millimeter time scale. Why that is very important? 
for strategic reasons. If there is some underground effort is going on, someone is making a bunker, the geode will change. So you cannot take a uh, satellite picture if something is going underground. If somebody is testing a nuclear weapon in the underground, the geode level will change. So this is an indirect measure, in indirect taking of picture that okay, if some geode is changing, something is happening. Yes. You can also detect uh, volcanic eruption. Before the volcanic eruption, probably several hours before something ha dynamic happens inside the uh, earth crust. And that can be predicted, that will change the geode level. You can detect tsunami, many things. So mapping geodesy, it is called geodesy, mapping geodesy is extremely important thing for several reasons. And that can be done using accurate atomic clocks of, of accuracy. So if the clock has an accuracy of 10 to the power minus 18, one can detect geode with an accuracy of one millimeter which at present is several meter. Okay, and, and, and many things, and there are some, I mean, if you want to read more, there are some examples with the uh, literature references, etc., etc. Okay, and I will actually cover a few of them, that's what I thought, but I'm running really late. So, let's start, so I have to really stop at 4.30. <laughs> yeah. I know I have to leave also. <laughs> Okay, so one thing is variation due to change of uh, reference frame, and that is local sure. Lorentz invariance. Okay, look, Lorentz invariance is a very good symmetry considered in our uh, standard model, but is it really true? And that is practically connected to again Einstein uh, equivalence principles and etc. And how one can test? Okay, that you know. So I'm skipping this side. Like uh, if things are not Lorentz invariant, then practically the laws of physics will be same in any reference frame, irrespective of their rotations and etc. etc. But is it really true? And if it is not true, then it will be violating CPT symmetry again, which is a very good thing to, to measure, which I already told you, and that would really require an extension of the standard model. So we know cosmic microwave background, I think all of you know, that is our rest frame in the universe, okay? And in the CMB, let's consider R, which is a rotating frame. It's rotating around its own axis and it's also circulating around the sun. So that means considering uh, CMB as a rest frame, our R is a rotating frame. So the experiment, what, uh, okay. So there are, there is this quantity which actually connects two different reference frames. I think you are probably familiar with this, this thing because it is very much used in astronomy and astrophysics. So this C mu nu is a coefficient which connects to different reference frame and this T is an again second order tensor which depends on the atomic property. What basically this T says what is the sensitivity of any particular atom if there is a change of reference frame. It could be zero. I mean according to the standard model this quantity has to be this entire quantity, this entire Hamiltonian has to be zero. But if it is, if it is found to be non-zero, that means its CPT symmetry is violating and that means uh, extension of the standard model is required. So what do we do? Let's take two clocks, which are extremely accurate clock. The accuracy is 10 to the power minus 18 or say. So I have like put these two clocks like two cats because physicists like cats, yes. even though I don't. But <laughs> let's say this, uh, tails are telling you the direction of the pendulum. So you have two clocks, identical clocks, which are oriented in two different directions. So that means this C mu nu coefficient for this clock and that clock will be different if, the, if this is non-zero quantity, right? And that means over time, if you see the tick rate of these two clocks, if this is non-zero, then these tick rates will be different and that's practically the whole idea. And people have done these things, already tried it with a clock which is accurate to 10 to the power minus 18. So in PTB Germany, they built two equilibrium ion clock which they have quantized in two different directions. The two clocks are nearly identical in their uh, accuracies and uh, precision. Uh, and then they quantized, they like quantized means direction are two different directions, orthogonal directions, and over a long period of time, they measured if they could find any difference in the tick rates. 
that's practical in the experiment. And why yttrium? Yttrium, this obstacle transition has the highest sensitivity. You might see that means this T0 thing, T0 quantity has the very high for uh, yttrium ion obstacle transition. That's why they choose yttrium ion. Clock. Okay. And this is their result. So this C mu nu is a tensor, so they can uh, put it in different for components and etc. So they measured all the components. And you see, you don't look into the numbers, but look into the orders. So they could measure, this is like upper bound of their measurement accuracy. So that doesn't mean actually this Lorentz symmetry is violating, but this is upper bound of their measurement accuracy. And their measurement accuracy, you look into the number, these are all on the order of 10 to the power minus 20, 20, 19, and etc. So same measurements has also happened to astronomy by looking into Poisson spectra. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And you there you look into this order, which is 10 to the power minus 15, 16. So the point is using the simple tabletop atomic physics experiment, one can do a very, very precise measurement of the quantity which cannot be done through astronomical observation. But that, that doesn't mean that astronomical observations are bullshit. No, it's not. Because these are two different, uh, two different, uh, like, uh, let's say, uh, generated in two different ways. The point is these two things has to match. They have to explain the same thing. Then only we can say, okay, this EPT symmetry is violating or not violating. By just doing one measurement, this measurement could be itself very wrong. And there are also other measurements also you can see like looking into transitions in this portium atom, looking into transitions in calcium, this is called Alcatraz experiment and so on, so on. So these are four different experiments looking into same, trying to answer the same question and they have to match. Then only we can say, okay, this is really violating or there is really an extension of the standard one. Okay, this was one example. Shall I skip this and go to... Uh, some so you have uh, 15 minutes here. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just rush through these things a little bit without. So the other thing is constancy of fundamental constants. Let's say fine structure constants or electron to proton mass ratio. Okay, I would skip this thing. So for that, looking into some fundamental, dimensionless fundamental constants is very important. Because if something has a dimension, that means your scale could be wrong. Yes. So if you are looking into the constancy of the fundamental constant, then you always have to look, oh, sorry, I'm not looking into your side. That's my <laughs> so you have to look into some quantities which are dimensionless. So then you can make sure that your scale doesn't play any role in this case. Okay, so our favorite one is fine structure constant for the electromagnetic interaction, alpha. And alpha, you know, this is the value. We have rated one over 137, etc. But if you write in terms of fundamental constant, it again includes several other fundamental constant. I have written it in this way because this part has a dimension of energy time distance and this part has a dimension of inverse of the energy time distance. Then it makes it look total, it makes like dimension less. Okay, now things it practically the, the interaction between electrons and nucle nucleons. So it's an electromagnetic interaction. So spinning of the electron creates some magnetic flux, and that is phi zero, this quantity. And phi zero, one can write in terms of two things. One is magnetic part and electric part. Only difference is this coefficient, permittivity and permeability. It's just way of writing. Okay, now let's take this quantity, Planck's constant times velocity of light. Believe me, you can write it in this way, and then you can express this thing in terms of phi e and phi m in this way, square root of phi e times phi m. If you take a partial derivative of this quantity, you know you get some sort of constant times this one. Okay, now take the entire alpha. Now take this entire alpha, you can again write it in terms of phi e and phi, but it's square root of phi e over phi m. Take another partial derivative, you get another different constant. This constant is different than this constant. But here, you get a minus sign, okay? So if alpha, or this is also, all everything is constant here. Here also alpha is constant. So I can make delta alpha by alpha is equal to zero, or delta <laughs> hc by hc is equal to zero. But then that is a problem. 
So if I take this part is 0, then for delta phi by phi is equal to minus delta phi m or phi m, that means electric energy is converted to magnetic energy or other way around, energy conservation. So far everything is good. But then using this same thing, how can I make, then if this is satisfied, then delta alpha by alpha is not 0. So that both has to be 0 if we are saying this constant. Okay? And that means one of these things is correct, right? So either there is some dark energy which is we are not able to see and then del this quantity is not really like that, something else is there or alpha is really changing uh, over time. Okay, this partial derivative is not good. Okay, so that means there is a, there is a flaw when we have to fix it. Okay, so this question was first tried to uh, answered by looking into quasar absorption spectra by Buckle in 1967 and this is a one page PRL paper. He just used some uh, spectroscopic techniques and quasar absorption and then he predicted delta alpha by alpha is 10 to the power minus 20 per uh, minus 12 per year, which was wrong because at that time the resolution of the spectrometer was very poor. He is uh, like uh, characterization of the spectrometer and calibration everything was completely wrong. But that, that actually opened a new field completely to look into whether alpha is constant or not constant. And uh, there are many theory to collect, we just keep that part. And since, since 1999, the serious effort started practically. The instrument was much better and everything, more data was available, etc. And several different type of experiment also came, not only looking into quasar absorption spectra, but clock, everything you can see that clock. I showed you the history of the clocks, etc. More accurate clocks came to, into the picture. Other spectroscopic techniques were also uh, produced, and etc. So, from 1999 to 2021, almost 20 years, over 20 years, there is an improvement of the limit by two orders of magnitude. You see, both are in 10 to the power minus 16, but this is 2.1, this is 0 0.01, so about factor of 20. So, that means uh, uh, 10 times one order of magnitude improvement in one decade. And these are all experimental limits. Yet, we have not found a value of alpha variation mm -hmm. because our experiment is not sensitive enough. Even with 10 to the power minus 18 accurate clocks, it's not sensitive enough to measure if there is any alpha variation. So that means that motivates you have to build better clocks or better ex other experimental techniques to measure it more accurately. Okay, so one thing, how can you do that is observing into past events. You can probably correlate with this th thing here, like he is like a Brahma or who can practically see everything what has happened throughout uh, any time in the beginning. So what are those past events? Looking into quasar absorption, quasar, quasar spectra, because the quasar spectra is like, quasars are several hundreds of billion light years away from us. So these light photons which are coming from there, they have traveled several hundred billion years. And if there is alpha is varying, it is varying enough over that long period of time so that we can see the uh, changes by looking very accurate calibrations and very accurately detecting this quasar absorption spectra. The other thing is, uh, this experiment, I don't know whether you are aware of not, on our art in Gabon, which is in South Africa, there is a natural nuclear reactor. So there is a nuclear, naturally, from the almost beginning of art, there is a natural nuclear reactor, and there, people have found an anomaly of the uranium-234 and 235 isotopes. So natural abundance of uranium-234 isotope is 0.72 percent, but in that nuclear reactor, natural nuclear reactor it has been found it is 0.6 percent and this uh, anomaly is probably because of alpha has varied over this long period of time uh, during the age of the universe so this model is like that okay the other thing is look in, look into the present event not quasar absorption spectra but something happening in present and compare very accurately and what are these things this is atomic physics experiment like clocks you build very accurate clocks in two different places and compare their tick rates. If alpha is varying, these tick rates should vary over some small amount of time and etc. 
or there are other examples basically, but I'm, you, you, since I have really no time, so I'm uh, hurrying a little bit. So practically the point is why the clocks? Because you know that energy level diagrams and the energy level, sorry, like energy levels of an any atomic state, they depend on alpha and yeah. different order of alpha. Yeah. So this is practically relativistic corrections, quantum electrodynamic corrections, and this is depends on alpha square, all the exponent of alpha. It's just practically impossible to consider all these things in the calculation because of the present computation powers and etc. etc. But that practically goes up to infinite. So if alpha, the concept is if alpha is varying, that means your energy level will shift. Yes. And then you can predict, you can detect it because of the very accurate clocks and etc. So maybe I will just quickly go to okay, sorry, go through these things. Uh, okay, that's what I am saying. That let's consider a two-level atomic system. Delta E is the energy level difference. You can write this omega clock frequency times uh, Planck's constant. Yes. So this delta E you can write in terms of some functional form of alpha and these are all constants. Okay, some functional form of alpha is alpha different exponent. If you take a time, uh, if you take a partial derivative of that, then you practically get delta alpha minus alpha with some constant quantity which say which is nothing but sensitivity factor. And this sensitivity factor is different for different energy levels of different atoms. Okay, and here you see like different species, neutral atoms, singly charged ions, so on, so on. And here I am plotting basically theoretically predicted sensitivity of some particular energy levels of these species. And yttrium is one of the very good candidates. Thorium is multiplied by 10 to the power 4 to put it in the same scale. Thorium is, thorium is nuclear transition which I was saying that people are trying to build a nuclear clock, that is exactly for this reason, because for your nuclear clock, there could be an enhancement by four orders of magnitude for this particular sensitivity factor. So instead of making a much accurate clock, you can also choose an element where the sensitivity factor is several orders of magnitude higher, so that you have a better chance to measure those things. Okay, uh, okay, so I would skip that. And now, this is a plot which practically, so don't look into these numbers, but look into the error bar. And what are the different colors? This is like fountain clock to fountain clock comparison, optical clock to fountain clock comparison, green one is optical clock to optical clock comparison, red one is the quasar, astronomy. Okay, this is nuclear fission and this is again atomic physics. These are different colors. And this axis is predicted value from different experiments or observations of delta alpha by alpha. So the question what Ritoban was imposing in the beginning, like why I am at Ayuka? And that is the answer. At Ayuka you probably know Sriyanand. Yes. Who looks, who works in the quasar absorption spectra. And our nearing neighbor institute, Nisim Kanekar, who also works in quasar spectra, but in the microwave. And they are the two pioneering people in the world who predicted this delta alpha by alpha. They both got Bhatnagar award because of this work. And they, these are both PRL papers in 2014 and 2000, I think, 18. Yeah, and, and Nisi actually spoke about his work in one of our colloquies. Okay, great. And uh, one of these points, and I can probably point out from this process, I think, I think maybe, maybe this one. Uh, 2000, no, 2014 would be somewhere here. Yeah. One of these red points is from Sri Anand's paper. But you look into the error bars and look into the error bars of the clock comparison. So this green one, you see the error bar you cannot just see. So for the green one, this is the optical clock to optical clock comparison and you don't see the error bar because it's so small. But for the quasar thing, the error bar is very large. Yes. Yeah. The point is, why I am at Ayuka? Because we are actually fundamentally looking into the same question, but only a different way. But it's a very difficult thing. For Sriyanand and Nisim, they have the data. They can sit in front of computer, analyze the data, and publish the paper. But we have to build the experiment. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. But unfortunately, Bhartsagur award has been stopped. So. <laughs> That's fine. I'm not really <laughs> like, yeah. But you get a small error, right? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. The, That's the, the end, we'll get it. So, 
So that's so so that's why basically you see the importance. Like practically, you are looking for the same question. You are trying to answer the same question in many different ways, and all of them are important because if something is there, the answer should come from all different different parts. Okay, I hope I convince you. I am skipping this. I have again skipping this. Rather, I would like to spend the last two minutes maybe if you allow me. Please. Uh, yes. So so now. Having said all these motivations, why clock is so important? I am trying to build an optical clock at Ayuga, and our major goal is to build an Ethiopian iron-based optical clock. And then in my neighboring institute in Aysal Pune, they are also building a strontium lattice clock. Our idea is to connect these two clocks by optical fibers and compare them, and really go into this kind of fundamental science experiments where India can. Do India so far have done any any such kind of thing? But the point is, we have to build these things, and these are very complex technologies, and that's what we are doing right now. So, uh, practically in the lab purpose, we have to generate photons which are very very stable. If you buy a laser, a very good laser, the stability of the photons from a sorry, from a very good laser is something like that, and we have to generate something like this. And for that, we need to build an optical clock. And you see, this is 10 to the power minus six or seven stability at one second, and this is 10 to the power minus 16 stability at one second. So going from 10 to the power minus six to 10 to the power minus 16, it requires several PhD students and their sleepless nights, <laughs> including supervisors. Okay. Uh, what do we have to do? That let me let me this again. I let me just skip. So if I divide the work, what we have to do for that purpose, these are like five blocks. And one is building the ion trap systems, laser cooling and trapping the ions. So that's just a simple box. But this is like let's say three, four PhD students. Okay. And then uh, uh, you you have to drive a narrow transmission. That means you have to generate a laser which is such narrow and which is that stable. And that is uh, 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 another few PhD students. Then you drive the transition, excite these atomic states, detect the fluorescence. But how do you know which frequency is that? So you have to synthesize that frequency, optical frequency, very accurately. Okay, that's another something. Then you have to put these fibers, and this fiber length is generally changing because of temperature, stress, and etc. So you have to st stabilize the length of the fiber, which may be hundred kilometers or thousand kilometers. That is called coherent optical fiber. That is like a quantum channel we call it. Our phase stabilization of the optical fibers. That's also something you have to develop in the lab. And fifth thing is, when you do all these things, then finally, like let's say today you have a PhD student who develops something. After 10 years, in between maybe 15 PhD students have passed. You don't want to take a risk that which knob you have to turn. You should be like automatized so that you <laughs> finally end one button. And everything should run when you are not present in the lab. Yeah. So that means automatization of this entire thing, and that is like data acquisition and control system. That is this blue line what is doing. So these all five blocks. It looks very nice uh, in this slide, but that really requires some effort and work, lot of uh, lot of uh, uh, instrumentation, thoughtful instrumentation, starting from really simulations, designing, fabrication. Once you fabricate, then there will be a lot of corrections, etc. You go back to your design simulations again, come back, fabricate, and then everything have to work together at the same time. Then only this kind of 10 to the power minus 18 or whatever accuracy number we are saying that's possible to achieve. Okay, and we are actually doing everything. These are pictures from our lab. You probably probably you know some of them, uh, and we have already developed quite a, some of these things. Let's say. In our lab, okay. And uh, this, uh, no, no, sorry, I'm going in the other direction. <laughs> And all these things, it's not that all these things are only important for clock purpose, but all these technology what we develop in the lab, we have several other applications. Particularly with this quantum 2.0, we are going into that era. All these technology when we develop in the lab, there are multiple other applications, and including LIGO, <laughs> including LIGO. So that's the another reason why I am, I am there. I am trying to do this experiment, which is practically not LIGO, 
but the technologies those are evolving in the lab they have direct some of them have direct applications in the life for example this uh, uh, distributed acoustic sensing using this phase stabilized optical fiber we can sense if there is any acoustic vibrations in the ground or not and that can be used as an input to correct the vibrations of the mirrors and etc okay so far so good so i'm coming to the conclusion one is we are really trying to build a state of the art experiment and that's the picture of the lab is actually quite old picture then we are trying to once this is developed then our aim is to investigate fundamental science using these optical clocks or optical clock comparisons this requires interdisciplinary expertise lasers optics vacuum electronic software development machining everything and all of them have to come together under the same umbrella and all of them have to work in a cohesive manner so people have to talk to each other okay and then it has national importance and global demand you know that our prime minister has launched this quantum mission national yeah. quantum national mission quantum. it is a 6000 crore yeah. it was launched just 10 days after the ligo wall uh, uh, flew and uh, we are practically uh, there was a precursor of that mission which is called quest and we are part of that thing so we hope that we will be part of the national quantum mission as well so and one of the mandate of this national quantum mission is not only just developing the quantum technology but develop but producing the highly skilled human beings because that is what india is lacking we really have like only few groups who are working in different aspect of the quantum technology and that's not enough so in next 5 years to 10 year time scale the main mandate of the mission is to generate enough human resource who can work on this things and this thing is only started it will evolve for another 50 years like you cannot expect a quantum laptop on your lap in next 10 years it will probably take 100 years who will build that thing in worldwide we are just starting we are just thinking in this way i won't i mean we are, india has started little late but it's actually the correct time it's not that late like a semiconductor mission i would say so in next 10 years really there are requirement of several thousand skilled manpower who can start their own lab or r&d things to take it further and that's the main mandate of this mission and final thing is having said that there will be enough job prospect for these people even if they don't get enough paper publications in 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 terms of numbers it's like what your hands will tell you what you can do in the future and i myself is also looking for uh uh phd and post doc thank you Okay, thank you, Shwadi, for this <coughs> very inspiring talk. I feel like going to your lab and start a new PhD or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, questions? Okay, yeah. Abhi. So, uh, thank you for this awesome talk. So, uh, what have you have you told? Is that about the constant of alpha, which is one of Madam Zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course, that is.